Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Simplify the Specialty Pharmacy Challenge. On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I'm going to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. First, we will begin today's webinar with a presentation and have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be made available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access that recording. And finally, if at any time you don't see your slides moving or have trouble with the audio, try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We are here to help. With that, I am pleased to welcome today's speakers. We have Mike Brown, Vice President of Managed Services for Cardinal Healthcare. Mike's 30-year healthcare industry career includes helping hospitals and health systems meet strategic priorities by leveraging the pharmacy's impact across the organization. An expert on the many facets of cost control that the pharmacy represents, Mike also has extensive insight and expertise on drug utilization management and compliance monitoring. We also have Larry Gray with us. Larry is the Chief Executive Officer of Seminole Hospital District. Larry has been the CEO for Seminole Hospital District since July 2019. He has been focused on improving and expanding patient services, physician recruitment, improving financial operations, and establishing a senior leadership team to implement the strategic initiatives identified in the Hospital Community Needs Report. Prior to Seminole, Larry was the administrator of a 300-bed hospital, administrator of a medical center with 30 physicians, COO of U.S. Oncology, and president and CEO of three health insurance plans. Mike and Larry, thank you very much for being here today. Mike, I will now turn the floor over to you to begin. Thank you, Molly. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody to this, or this webinar. I think we have an interesting topic, and I'm just going to jump right in. <clears throat> with my role with Cardinal Health, I have a lot of conversations with leaders of health systems about the strategy for their pharmacy. How do they incorporate pharmacy into what the health system is trying to do overall? Historically, that's really been more of an acute strategy. However, with the transition of care, we're seeing that this conversation has become more of a community-based strategy, and they're really trying to figure out how does pharmacy help them with the community. And that's where this topic has really came up recently is uh, around specialty medications and the strategies that they would like to incorporate to, to help their communities with, with specialty medications. <clears throat> you can really understand that that it's making is becoming a issue because if you look, you know, over time from the last 10 years, there's been a five-fold increase of specialty medica medications in the marketplace. And what the administrators are seeing is that the patients they serve in the community or the customers they have in the community, they're going elsewhere to get these medications. They're not providing that service to them. And that's a gap in what they're wanting to do. And they're trying to figure out, how do I, how do I close that gap? And I understand why uh, they would want to do that, because in the retail um, outpatient setting uh, where you're dispensing medications, there's a lot of industry experts that believe that 40% of the revenue is going to be driven by these medications. And they don't want to be cut out of that. So what are the strategies they can put together to really implement a specialty strategy for their, for their health system? The most common thing they come to me and say, hey, Mike, I need to have a specialty pharmacy. And when I talk to them about what that really means, uh, they're not real sure because it is a complex uh, problem to overcome. And that's where we really try to come in and help them out. Um, so with that, I'd really like to ground everybody on how we view uh, a specialty strategy and, and how you can go about doing that for a, for a health system. First, I'd like to define what a specialty medication is because there's a lot of confusion around that. The first thing about a specialty medication, it's high cost. You're dealing with high dollar, dollar medications and treatments. But I really bucket, my team buckets specialty medications into two groups. The first one is PBM classified specialty medications. So these are drugs that are, have complex dosing regimens. Uh, they require monitoring. They probably require interventions with the patients. Uh, they're complicated administrations. A lot of them are, are injectable. But each, every PBM has a list. So you really need to understand what's on their list. The reason that's important is because if you really want to get into this you may, and have a pharmacy, you're probably denied 
access to adjudication. So they're not going to let you, they're not going to reimburse you for that. You'll have access to the medications, but you're just not going to be in the network. So that's something you need to, to think about. The second list, this is really more of the traditional one. This is the limited distribution drugs. And these are drugs that the manufacturers are putting limits on. And they have very stringent requirements. In order for you to gain access to these drugs, you have to be accredited. You have to meet certain standards. And the thing about this is, this is not like the, um, you, if you build it, they will come. Just because you have an accredited state, uh, especially pharmacy, it does not get you automatic access to these drugs. You have to earn that. And most specialty pharmacies will never get total access to all those drugs. So you just have to realize that and go after where your opportunities are. The most common thing I hear from administrators are they believe they need to have this accredited specialty pharmacy in order to go after these drugs. And that's where I really want to kind of have them tap their brakes a little bit and really talk about what they're trying to do and what are some of the options that they may have for their health system that really drive the overall goals they're trying to achieve. I want to space our state that I do believe every health system should have a effective specialty strategy. And there's some benefits to that and I, I, I want to help health systems figure that out. Um, some of those benefits are, are pretty simple. Um, they want to serve their community. And right now, their customers in their community are having to go outside their network to get access to these drugs. By having a specialist strategy that increases the care continuum for the patients and the prescribers. And by definition, especially, those are probably your high-risk patients you're serving today. And they want to be the ones offering that service to them. They don't want them to leave the community. So that's a big benefit for them just because that's their potential customers. Another benefit to having a really effective strategy is that there's a lot of regulatory and quality requirements that are going to be required in order to gain access to these medications. And this is things you will not find in a the standard retail pharmacy. You're going to be looking at, you know, compliance standards. You're going to be looking at reporting standards. You're going to be looking at quality metrics. And you have to have a very efficient back office system of way of monitoring that in order to gain access. And it's going to be part of your strategy. And there's a lot of things that uh, I help health systems do to get that. The last one is a financial. It's a pure financial play. By Gaining access and being able to prescribe these physicians and um, adjudicate them, it's a new revenue stream. Um, so there's a, a financial aspect of why you would want to do this. The second one is, especially if you're self-insured as this organization, you can minimize the employee benefit plan expenses. You can just provide care for less, ex or for less. and that's a, a, that's a very valuable thing to have for a health system. And then if you're 340B, um, facility, you can really maximize that program and really take it to another level. So those are some of the big benefits about considering having a specialty strategy. So how do you go about really understanding and designing what's right for you? Because this is not a one-size-fit-all model. You do not have to have accredited pharmacy to go after some of this stuff. So we go through a process. Uh, with them to really identify, is there opportunity? If there is opportunity, what does it look like? And how do I go about that? And how do I set my strategy? We first start with key drivers, okay? So we'll ask you for the patient mix. This includes patients. Um, we want to know what your, what, what your uh, population is. You know, what are the, the disease states that you're working with? We'll probably ask you for claims data and really find out, you know, what drugs are you prescribing? What drugs are leaving your network? So we know which, what we need to be going after. The second one is a payer mix. All payers are different. And they work with different uh, PBMs. Some are easy to work with and will give you access into their system. Some are very difficult and have very stringent requirements. So that's part of the analysis that we need to do is just how tough is this going to be to have a successful strategy pro or a specialty strategy with, with your payers. The third one is this is a long-term goal. And if you're doing a strategy, you always have to think long-term, is who in your community today, what businesses are self-insured that are having the same issues as, as you are as a health system? 
They're self-insured. They see their expenses go up, and their and their employees are having to leave the community to get access to these drugs. Now, that's a long-term strategy, but at some point, you may want to go out and start partnering with those businesses to help them resolve the same issues that you're having. So once we do that assessment and get a better idea of what we're looking at, um, we, we'll have options. Um, the, let's say that there's no opportunity there. You really don't have an opportunity to gain access to um, to PBM designated drugs. There's just not enough of them to justify putting a, a retail pharmacy in to go after them. Uh, you just don't have the opportunity there. What would I would suggest, especially if you're a 340B uh, facility, get a, a contract pharmacy network. I mean, you can pull in revenue from that. At least you're participating from a financial benefit standpoint. And get one with a specialty pharmacy. It's not going to hit your need of, you know, offering the service to your customers, but it will hit the financial need that you may be looking for. If you do this assessment and you see that there is an opportunity to drive into, uh, uh, to go after these specialty medications, you got to ask yourself a couple things. Do I have a pharmacy today? If you don't, can you justify building one? And I always recommend start there. If you already have a pharmacy, let's leverage that pharmacy. What you're going to want to do is go after those PBM designated drugs now because you have access to them. It's just a matter of you getting into those networks. And we have a lot of strategies on how you do that. But the important thing about that and why I think it's important, remember, these drugs are going to require compliance data. They're going to require reporting and quality metrics. By starting with your retail pharmacy and going after those first, you will learn how to do that, and you will be setting a history of your quality standards, and your total goal is to be at the same level, if not better, than the specialty pharmacies that are already in those networks. So you're really competing with them around quality to allow yourself to get in those networks, and you're really going to need that if you make that decision to get accredited and go after the LDDs. Uh, because that's what they're going to look at to let you have access and let you into the network. Let's say that you've done this assessment and you do have an opportunity to go after the LDDs. So you're going to do an accreditation. You're going to accredit your pharmacy. I always say start with the accreditation of your current retail pharmacy. Start there, and as you grow, you may have to do some alternatives. But the key here is, is this gets back to your paramix. You need to understand who your major players are because some of them require dual accreditation. Some of them have specific regulatory agencies that they ask you to use for accreditation. So you really need to have all that play in before you go into that. I said start with your, re your retail pharmacy and grow it. As you grow it, there's going to hit a point where those payers are going to re reduce reimbursement to your retail side. You may want to avoid that. And it, to do that, you, you'll need to split it. So you will need to have a specialty pharmacy and a retail pharmacy. Um, some states allow you to do that within the same pharmacy. You just need different licenses. Some states will not. You'll need a new location. So all of that has to be in your planning uh, to really map that out onto where, you're, where you want to get and how you want to get there. Uh, but the point here is you have options. You don't just have to build a, a accredited specialty pharmacy. You can do other things on your path. What I want to do next is just walk you through a couple of examples of how we've helped people with their strategy and kind of give you an idea of what they're looking at. Um, my first example, this is a, a very, this is a small rural hospital. They do have a, a retail pharmacy. It's very small. It's just one pharmacist, so it's not a, a big operation. When we were walking through their specialty strategy and what they're looking at, they were pretty skeptical about it. Uh, like I said, being small, they just wanted to make sure it was done right and didn't want to jump into anything. So we did a little trial. What we did is we, we took a pharmacist from the inpatient pharmacy in the hospital, put them in the GI clinic for two days a week. We knew from our assessment that was their biggest opportunity was the prescriptions being written in that GI clinic. And, and for two months, we monitored it. First month, that pharmacist only found 10, 10 prescriptions that he could send over to the outpatient pharmacy. We'd already worked through benefits and stuff, so we knew we had access to the network in this case. But those 10 scripts for that one month generated 28000 in gross profit for, for that, little, that little pharmacy. 
The next month, he only found eight. That generated 63,000 in gross profit. Now, this is a 340B facility, so that's why these margins are so large. But that gets back to what I'm saying. You can really maximize your program by getting into specialty medications. Once we did that, this is a no-brainer for the leadership. They said, yeah, let's just get into this. Let's do more of this. So our first step on that was we hired a tech. We trained them. We, they put in them into the clinic. Now that technician has trained and worked with the, the practitioners over there to drive volume to our outpatient pharmacy. First four months, we had averaged 60000 in new gross profit for that pharmacy, which is significant for a small hospital and a small pharmacy in this community. Since then, we only we started this as we just targeted the GI because we knew that was that was the most opportunity. Since then, we are now expanding into other disease states and other clinics to go after other opportunities. It's a, it's, it's not something we came up, but we always use the the model land and expand. Start your service, then start expanding it, so you can grow it and become more profitable and serve more patients. The next uh, next example is this is actually a hospital that decided they had the opportunity to go after LDDs to get accredited, uh, an accredited specialty pharmacy. And the main reason they wanted to do that is they felt their patients were leaving the community to go after these medications, and they wanted to offer that service to them. So a little bit of background on the hospital. It is a 340B hospital. You know, it's a dish hospital. They have 42 100 employees, so it's a good mid-sized hospital, and they're self-insured. What they also had was a retail store up and running today, and it is operating pretty efficiently, just a typical retail store. They had a, uh, a contract pharmacy relationship with a specialty pharmacy that was very successful. It was generating just over a million dollars annually just for those specialty scripts um, that was going to that, that pharmacy. Um, however, once again, they wanted to have this service offered to their customers so they weren't leaving the community. So when we did this analysis, we showed them that this whole service they had, they were paying 240000 annually to an administrative fee to the PBM. They were paying another 360000 as a dispensing fee to that specialty pharmacy. So there's an opportunity just there uh, at 600000 Driving all this, was only 420 prescriptions a year. So we knew they could take that volume on without really impacting their day-to-day -day functions in their retail pharmacy. We just needed to get it accredited and start transitioning all that over. They did do that. They have been transitioning it. But once, I mentioned this earlier, they got to a point that they were driving so much revenue through that pharmacy that they were starting to see it affect their retail reimbursement. So they had to make the decision to separate it they are in a state that requires it needs to be in a new location. The good news is, is we knew that, so we had already identified the location, and we were easy, we easily could transition that to move it off, and they didn't skip a beat. But that was something they had to plan for, and it's something you really need to think about. They are to the point now that they're wanting to go out into the community and look for uh, businesses that are self-insured and really to start expanding their model. So these are a couple examples of why I'm, I'm very pro having a, a specialty strategy because I think it can be a tremendous benefit to the organization and to your community. And now I'm going to turn this over to Larry because this is kind of the academic portion of the presentation. Larry is an actual leader in a health system who has a specialty pharmacy strategy, and he's going to go through how they came up with that and what the benefits were, not only to his organization, but to the community he's, he serves. So Larry, I'm turning it over to you. Thanks, Mike. Welcome, everyone. It's an honor to be with you. Um, before we get into the pharmacy piece and our approach here, just wanted to give you a little background on Seminole Hospital District. Um, we do sit in the middle of West Texas, uh, midway between Lubbock and uh, Midland. Um, so we service primarily Gaines County, if anybody wants to look that up, a population of about uh, 40,000 and growing. So as a true rural critical access hospital, um, if we weren't here, people would be driving an hour to an hour and a half for care. Uh, Seminole has been here since 1971. 
and our services continue to grow. Um, besides the hospital and clinic, we do have a skilled nursing facility, assisted living facility. We are the major fitness center for the community and are lucky enough to have aero care services as well. Um, this summer, we're completing a $48 million construction expansion project. Everybody is ready to see that done. Um, and we are continuing to recruit well. We have four, soon to be five, family practice OB physicians, um, a full-time surgeon, and four family nurse practitioners. So it's a busy clinic um, with that group. Our labor and delivery averages 70 babies a month. Um, we have a busy and growing emergency department, which drives inpatient observation uh, status, as well as clinic follow-up visits, and especially our pharmacy volume. We are the largest employer um, in the community, and our current staff turnover rate is sitting at 4%. Our motto of stay healthy, stay close was developed uh, because of our commitment to the community. We wanted to make sure that we could provide um, the maximum amount of services we could with the facility and staff that we had and really try to keep people from traveling um, if they didn't need to. So as we looked at um, the pharmacy um, development. This was really in conjunction with our uh, first community needs assessment, and we spent a lot of time doing this. Um, it's, it's one of those um, efforts that you get out what you put into it. So rather than just getting the demographics and rather than just focusing on who's in your community and what services might they want, we held uh, four different focus groups as well so we could hear the anecdotal pieces and make sure that we understood the community as well as we thought. Uh, we found there was a lot of old thinking, things that had been around for a while, and people didn't recognize that the demographics had changed, the attitudes had changed, and that uh, really drove a lot of our um, desire to make sure that we got this right. So from the community needs analysis, we um, really had three major headings under that provider recruitment, which we pretty much completed, service expansion, which we have uh, defined, and then our resident education piece. Um, and under that umbrella was a very clear mandate to make sure that we changed our health benefits plan, as well as our third party administrator. Um, as a self-insured employer, um, the current plan and the administrator just weren't meeting our needs. So we looked at four different health plans, we looked at three different administrators, and settled on a new uh, group um, January of this year, so just a few months ago. Um, as we analyzed the health benefits and as we looked at what we wanted to design um, pharmacy became a major um, discussion in terms of uh, how we were going to move forward um, in this benefit uh, design piece. At that point, we turned to our payer agreements, uh, became a large focus of our analysis. What did we have now? How old were they? Did we really understand them? And could we move language that would benefit us uh, more long term? Fortunately, there are a few of us on staff who have some health plan experience, um, so we could um, get through that um, pretty pretty well, but it was a, a very intense uh, time to get through those agreements. All the while, the pharmacy services vision um, to meet our community needs um, and provided uh, and getting the right data to measure our results was key in this um, analysis. So um, we were surprised to discover really how young our patient population was. Um, you know, the, the good thing about young folks is for the most part they're healthy at this point, but they're not very good at um, routine checkups. 
Uh, they're not great at follow-ups, and most of them struggle with health care as most people do nationally, and that is that the coverage isn't very good. You have a lot of out-of-pocket costs. Um, and um, you, you are in this situation where um, the um, uh, cost of that just continues to, um, to rise. Um, fortunately for us, because of the young population, it does drive a lot of services like L&D, and so that's helpful. But I think that one of the um, areas that we looked at in terms of uh, helping this high cost is to look at direct employer contracting, which we're doing through a statewide organization in Texas uh, to see if we can get some leverage there. The other piece that really popped out was kind of lack of transportation, uh, particularly for the elderly. And uh, we have worked with the religious leaders um, in the community and created a co coalition which is coordinated through the hospital just to help folks who uh, can't uh, get where they need to get to or don't have adequate transportation um, to help them out of that um, situation. And pharmacy continued to be um, in this theme as well. So as we focused really on building revenue and um, building volume, it became very clear that we needed to expand hours, um, expand our focus on telemedicine. Um, the expanded hours helped a lot with keeping primary care out of the ER and let them do what they do best. Um, increasing the number of specialists who came in, not just once a month, but many of them now are coming in twice a month. Health education is not just a feel-good activity for us, um, you know, we're really looking to affect change, change in behavior, change in the way the physicians and patients interact. And those classes, although they take time and effort, um, in the beginning we didn't get the participation that we thought we would get, but these classes do build as uh, the community begins to their word of mouth um, in terms of the effectiveness of those. Um, and through all of these changes, we started to see increase in pharmacy volume um, and at the same time, an increase in specialty drugs. So when we look at um, kind of partnering with this focus on uh, what are we going to do with our overall pharmacy strategy, what are we going to do with the specialty drugs, <clears throat> at this point, um, we really dug deep into what we were spending now, what that distribution was, getting a handle on those high-cost drugs. Um, Mike, Mike gave a definition of that earlier, and it was a definition that worked for us. And then how do we impact that <clears throat> discussion between the physician and the patient and the discussion between the hospital and our pharmacy partner as we realigned our overall benefit plan. So this hard work, and we call it hard work, but really paid off in that we could look at patterns of spending and opportunities for cost savings. Um, price increases obviously came out. The shortage of generic drugs, uh, both oral and injectables came out. And then the increase in high cost specialty drugs as we saw an increase in complex patients also was a um, key factor in um, looking at kind of our um, approach going forward. Um, Mike mentioned the increase in uh, specialty drugs. I think there are over 300 on our list now. Um, I also understand there are over 700 uh, specialty drugs under development. So this is a tidal wave that's headed our way. And I think that um, I would encourage everybody to try to get ahead of that wave uh, as quickly as they can. So <clears throat> in our old model, um, we had two retail change, these chains. These are national chains here in Seminole providing pharmacy services. Um, their markup was high. Their cost was high. 
Um, fortunately, I think for us and not for the community, uh, these two retail pharmacies in the community were not especially well liked. Um, so we were in a situation where um, the community was supportive of us uh, building and expanding a retail uh, pharmacy operation. In addition to building volume and controlling costs, it was just good for the patients and good for the physicians to have a pharmacist here in the building that people could talk to, that people could develop a relationship with, and we took a major percentage of the two retail pharmacies in the community, um, and that's continuing to grow. So I think having the right partner, having the in-house pharmacy, and a great relationship between the doc and pharmacist, pharmacist is good for the community and good for the bottom line. Again, our community was totally supportive of this effort, and it was a true game changer in terms of providing services and controlling costs. So what's next for us? Um, like any good continuous uh, quality improvement model, we'll take all of our activities, we'll continue to measure them, we'll continue to see where we can improve. Obviously, this process becomes uh, much easier when you have the right vision, when you have the right analysis, and when you have the right partner. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Mike. Thank you, Larry. <clears throat> Yeah, as a kind of a wrap, I just wanted to say here's, you know, we're, there's a four tips. I mean, um, fully understand your community's needs, you know, establish close relationships with your patients, you know, engage active support from the hospital leadership. I, I cannot underestimate that. It, it makes things a lot easier when a pharmacy gets the leadership involved because uh, th now you're helping them with their strategy. And, and analyze your opportunity. Uh, that's it, very important. Uh, it uh, helps you avoid making any um, bad decisions uh, on your journey. So those are just kind of a summary of what I wanted to go over this afternoon. With that, uh, Molly, I'll go back to you for question and answers if, if people have them. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Mike and Larry, for that great presentation. Attendees, we will now begin today's question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have by typing them into the Q&A chat box you see there on your webinar console. Larry and Mike, let's get started with our first question that came in, and that is, we want to increase prescription capture at our hospital's retail pharmacy. What tips can you share to help drive traffic? Mike, can I turn to you first for your thoughts here and then see if Larry would like to add anything? Yeah, the, it sounds like the question was about their retail pharmacy. It's not going to be... It, 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 can, it works both ways. How do you capture scripts for just a regular retail? And how do you capture scripts for a, a specialty uh, order? Um, there's some strategies out there to do that. I, I think that you have to really think of your pharmacy as a business and, and promote it, okay? So make sure all your phys physicians know that you, you have this service and you're offering it. I think um, signage is important in your, you know, your emergency room. Um, what really works well is if you develop a you know meds to beds program, so you're going after your discharge uh, prescriptions. And then if your physician clinics are close, or you have physician offices close, you make sure that everyone knows that and that you have you know signage in those in those facilities as well, just to drive drive that home. A couple things you can do is, is um, you know work with your benefits. I, I'm going to tell people this all the time. Make sure you're getting. You, you're hand in hand with your benefits team um, because you can incentivize your employees to use your pharmacy um, by giving them credits, rebates, whatever. Um, so that's a way of, of driving it, making sure your own employees are using the pharmacy. So those are just a few. And they work for the specialty side as well. Terrific. Next question that came in from an attendee is, if your hospital is not 340B eligible, is it worth pursuing specialty pharmacy? Yeah, I'll take that one, Larry. Um, 
once again, one size does not fit all. Maybe it'll be more difficult. It definitely won't have the same financial impact, but you're going to have to make that decision. Is that something you want to do for the community? And can you do it in such a way that there's an ROI there, or even if there's not an ROI, it's acceptable because it's the right thing you want to do for, for your community and the patients you serve. So you definitely need to do an analysis on that. Um, and just knowing, no know going in, there's probably not going to be a big financial windfall. Hopefully that helps. Perfect. Well, another attendee would like some distinction between specialty pharmacy and retail pharmacy. They asked, to start a specialty pharmacy, the institution already needs a retail pharmacy, correct? A specialty pharmacy cannot be started as part of the existing hospital pharmacy that's already running. Is that correct? Mike, Go ahead, Mike. weighing in on that one first? Yeah, I'm thinking about the question. Um, what I'm recommending is that you do want to have a retail pharmacy to go along with your specialty pharmacy. The reason for that is, is because you can get started quicker going after the PBM designated before you'll ever get your accreditation for the specialty pharmacy. And just know going in that you're going to have to separate those at one point, at some point. Um, I haven't necessarily seen anyone who just stood up and accredited specialty pharmacy and they're just going after those drugs. Uh, that's typically not the model that, that we've seen out there. Now, I'm not saying that you, know, you can't do that, but um, our recommendation is you start with the retail. It, uh, it, it, once again, the question is going to be is can you justify building one? Um, and so you have to go back to that assessment. But, yeah, I think you need to have both. Um, the difference between the two is, you know, in the retail model, this is really about efficiencies. You're trying to get – scripts out. You re I mean, remember our, the reimbursement is tight on those, so it's really about efficiencies. When you move into those specialty scripts, it's more about quality and measurements. Uh, it gets, it's a lot of paperwork, so it's, it's not as efficient. So um, that's the difference between the two. Um, however, they can coexist up until a point that, um, that you're bringing in so much volume on the specialty, you're going to get dinged on your reimbursement on your retail, then you'll have to make a move. Hopefully that helped. Larry, I'll start with your thoughts on this next question, and then Mike, if there's anything you would like to add to Larry's response. But this attendee would like to know, what is the best way to analyze the opportunity for a specialty pharmacy? Perhaps you can talk a little bit about your thought process and analysis at Seminole, and then we can open it up, too, to hear from Mike. Yeah, so this was the uh, deep digging, I think I mentioned in the presentation, that you're looking at the data that you currently have in terms of your spend and what's happening with your own employees, but at the same time, you're looking at what's going on with the payers. So there are two big buckets there, one coming from your third-party administrator, whoever that may be, or your own in-house uh, claims group if you're doing that in-house and then looking at what you're getting from the um, payers as well in terms of their uh, their analysis, and all of that has to be um, analyzed together to get to get a big picture. We were able to look at the drugs that we wanted to focus on first. We were able to look at what was going to be important for us, giving the specialists that we had here, and then um, also the level of services that we. Uh, provide. I think that um, everyone is seeing more complex patients as they're coming in, and I think that's going to um, uh, really put you in a situation that you want to have that data, you want to understand it, and have a strategy going forward. Thanks, Larry. Thanks. Is that. there anything you would add? Molly, I'll build okay. on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, First of all, we talked a little bit in my presentation about how you have to do a, uh, an assessment of what you have. I think Larry explained that pretty well, and that's how they went about figuring it out. The one thing that uh, I caution people on, they they, they want to just jump in and do everything at once. Um, we try to do an approach where let's let's find out where your biggest opportunity is. That gets back to that the, the example I get about the GI clinic. Start there. Get good at that and then expand. Once again, it's kind of cliche, but land and expand. 
Um, and as new new entrants come into the market, you're ready for them, and you can add them into your into your service, and it will continue to grow. You just need to be prepared that this is a growing market, and there's going to be changes, and you're going to have to be ready to go after those medications to make sure you're getting access to them and 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 getting into the networks to to be able to adjudicate them. Terrific. Thank you both for your thoughts on that question. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. This next question is seeking some advice. What advice can you give me about negotiating changes in our employee benefit plan? Well, I, uh, this is Larry. I'll take the first stab at that. You know, as a self-funded employer, if you are, you have to remember that you really have control. You can design whatever you want to design. Um, and then figure out the partners that you're going to have to make that work. Um, and I would recommend you have a third-party administrator. I think it's not work a hospital should take on, but there are others who have a different opinion. So I think um, sitting back and understanding the design you want to build, including your uh, pharmacy benefit, and then finding the right group that's going to adjudicate that for you um, is the key to understanding those um, um, those those data and uh, getting a successful program. Um, it, it takes several conversations with several different groups to really get a picture of what you can do and what you um, can offer. If you're fully insured or partially insured, then that's a whole different picture. Um, unless you're in in with some large affiliated group, I think there's not much opportunity to have an impact there as a uh, one-off um, employer who is um, fully insured. Thanks, Larry. Mike, is there anything you would like to add to Larry's thoughts? No, I think Larry answered that um, pretty well. The, the point I would make is you really need the leadership's involvement in this one. Um, if you want to drive their benefits program, the leadership has to be on board. Um, pharmacy can be involved, but it's got to kind of come from the top of the house because that's when things really get done. So I would say don't try to do it yourself from just a pure pharmacy perspective. Get administration involved. There's, they will be your biggest ally. Okay. Another attendee would like to know if rural hospitals have an advantage in the specialty pharmacy space. Um, potentially, and there's a couple of reasons why. A lot of them are 340B, so that's an advantage right off the bat. A lot of them are isolated, um, so there's a need to serve their community. Um, and a lot of them have clinics, um, physician offices, uh, just because of their where they're at, I mean, then it just depends on what the patient population is, what their employee population is. Are you seeing the the, the, the disease states and the medications being prescribed? I would say, as time goes, that opportunity will increase because we are saying that these specialty medications are going to grow, and you're going to see more disease states covered, more options out there. So, yeah, I think there's an opportunity there. I would just add that uh, your market area and your patient capture, caption area may be larger than you think. Um, while we identify as Gaines County, um, our market area is much larger than that, and you can uh, do that analysis and really figure out what your uh, current patient capture is geographically and then where you can grow. Wonderful. And speaking of market area, Larry, I'll stay with you for this next question as well. And that is, how was the experience in getting the payers on board? Can you speak to what you saw firsthand based on payers in your market area? Yeah, we had uh, really uh, very little pushback on the mechanics of this and the strategy of this. Um, I think the hardest part of standing up the retail pharmacy, besides all the pharmacy stuff they have to do with licensing and stocking and such, 
was just getting the um, electronic systems to work together. So I would um, uh, ask, really caution everybody that that may take more time than you think in terms of getting the uh, electronic approvals, getting the PBM uh, folks uh, involved, and making sure that you have 70 to 80 percent of that already electronically connected before you open the doors. Um, we were surprised, really, that that took longer than we thought it was going to take. I don't know whether COVID had an impact on that or not, um, but uh, that's where having a good partner, um, in this case for us, Cardinal, uh, to drive that was essential because as a hospital, we would have never figured that out on our own. And Mike, if there's any observations or thoughts you wanted to add to payers' response or, or what payers, um, what, what yeah, it's, in payers yeah. in dynamics, that would be great to hear from too. Yeah, I think Larry's right. I mean, if you're self-insured, it's, it's easier. Um, but also, it depends on who your who your payers are, uh, because if the payers have relationships with the bigger PBMs, um, it makes it more difficult just because they have strict, stricter requirements. I'm not saying you can't get it, it's just going to take you longer to get there. So. All right. Well, that is all the time we have for today. So I want to again thank Mike and Larry for their excellent presentation and their thoughtful responses to the questions that came in from attendees. I'd also like to thank Cardinal Health for sponsoring today's webinar. To learn more about the content that was presented today, please check out that resources section on your webinar console and fill out the post-webinar survey. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you have a wonderful afternoon.